Good morning. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, there you go. Uh, I do want to begin, uh, one, by reminding you that Summer Blast starts tomorrow, Monday through Wednesday, okay? Uh, each night at 5, we'll have pizza, and then it begins from 6 to 8 at Big Springs Park. So come out, help, bring your kids, bring your grandkids. Uh, it should be a really, really good time, a good time to get the gospel out to our community and to our own uh, and just to learn how to live for the Lord. So Summer Blast starts tomorrow through Wednesday. I also want to give a huge shout out and thank you to all of you who contributed, who prayed for, who thought of, uh, who helped out for the youth trip that we had last week. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful trip. Uh, we learned what it meant to abide in Christ. We had fun. We played games. Your very own youth group brought home the first ever Blue Horizon Cup, which means we competed with five other youth groups um, doing various mental and physical challenges, and we came home with the trophy. Um, but even more, we learned what it meant to love the Lord and live for Him. We deepened relationships that we have with one another. We began new relationships with other brothers and sisters in Christ and other youth groups. So it was a fruitful and wonderful week, and it could not have happened without you. So thank you so much for all that you did. Um, and with that, let's stand and exalt the Lord together.
Reading this morning from Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. Philippians 1, verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we praise your name and we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to read your word. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to be under the preaching of your word, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to sing praises to you and regarding the truth of your word, Lord, we thank you that you've allowed us to gather together this morning to worship you, Lord. We pray that you would draw us close to you this morning as we desire to worship you, that we might worship you in a manner that is pleasing to you, that glorifies you. Remove all distractions from our, from our hearts, from our minds, Lord. I pray these things, Lord. I pray also that you would guide us, that as your scripture says in verse 27, that our manner of life would be worthy of the gospel of Christ, Lord. Guide us that as we live, Lord, we would honor you and be worthy to be called your children. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue to sing together.
righteous and whole in you. We just pray for this time, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word and strengthen us and guide us. And it's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. We probably don't say often enough how much we appreciate David Skinner and his family and the sacrifices that they make for this church both in the worship ministry and leading our youth. 
Uh, they had a wonderful week this week. I got first-hand accounts seeing as uh, four of the six in my family were there. Uh, the others had to suffer in Springville while everyone was at the beach. But we appreciate the work that he is doing, investing in our youth. And uh, we will see the spiritual fruits from that. And so we're so thankful for all that he does. Our passage this morning comes to us from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17. I'll read verse 18 to complete the sentence, but I'd like to pick that verse up next week. And it's talking about walking by standing. You'll see what I mean, walk by standing. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, the Apostle Paul writes to the saints who reside in Ephesus and by virtue of them to those saints who reside in Springville. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and As shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we've sung your praises because you are worthy of praise. Our worship is directed to you. Remove any human-centeredness from it and allow us to worship you freely from faith-cleansed hearts. And this morning, as we gaze into your glorious word, our request is single. Grant us the inner courage to stand against the forces of evil in this evil day. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Spiritual warfare, the invisible war, is the context that Paul is dealing with. Some people, I've noticed, think that every bad thing that happens to them is Satan attacking them personally. This is highly unlikely, but it can be traced back to Satan's architectural influence. I'll speak to that in a moment. But he has established a world system that runs itself. Satan neither is omnipresent meaning present at all times as God is, nor is he omniscient, meaning all-knowing as God is. There are things Satan does not know. But often our spiritual battles are not with him personally, but rather with the consequences of our own sinful choices or passions. Even so, at least five levels of spiritual warfare directly or indirectly apply immense pressure on the child of God. Each one, now I'll I'll speak to each of these five, but each one traces back to the architecture of the world system Satan designed. Beginning in Genesis 3 when he unleashed sin in the world and then the construct that flowed forth from that. And here we are as elect children of God in Satan's uh, sin-filled world, which he's been given to rule for a short time. These five levels you will experience at one time or another, except perhaps the first one. And you may experience it, but let me mention them. Number one, these are levels of spiritual warfare that the Christian might experience. Number one, direct satanic attack. This is rare. This is unlikely for you personally. 
but we read of Adam, Eve, Job, and Judas, all of whom were attacked directly by Satan as human creatures. So he does have that capability. Now, Christians all the time say, well, Satan is harassing me, Satan is attacking me. It's very unlikely. You are placing yourself on the level of of people who appear in the scripture when you say that. More likely what is happening in your case is the second level, direct demonic attack. Demons are fallen angels who chose to align under Satan. Their number is vast. They can attack Christians directly. They can possess non-Christians and they can influence situations around Christians to try to steal, kill, or destroy their faith or their life. So that's the second level. The third level is indirectly, and it's indirectly through original inherited sin. This is a form of spiritual warfare. We inherited a sin nature from our forefather and federal head, Adam. Though we are redeemed, we still carry the relics of inherited sin within our flesh. Our fleshly lusts and inclinations create terrible spiritual battles for us. Now, we often blame this on spiritual warfare, and in some sense, it is. But the reality is, we make sinful choices. No one makes them for us. Yes, we might be disadvantaged. Yes, we might be in a uh, hurricane of, of spiritual attack. But at the end of it all, we make sinful choices. Those sinful choices have consequences. And we often compound our situation and our spiritual battle by piling up poor choices on top of one another. This is why you need to talk with your elders when you're in serious trouble, because they can bring a spiritual sense of reason to stop you from making poor sinful choices to try to correct other poor sinful choices. You might not like what you hear from them, but they're here to guide you and to help you get out of that cycle. But to escape your sense of culpability You, we, often cry out, well, I'm under attack. I'm in spiritual warfare. Yes, you are, but it's because you chose to be by acting on your selfish and sinful passions and then tried to cover it up and fix it with ways that are unscriptural. So we have this spiritual warfare that comes to us indirectly through original inherited sin. Number four, we have an indirect attack through the world system. Satan, we've come to understand, has crafted a world system specifically designed to find every person's weakest link. If you struggle with pornography, you don't have to go looking for pornography. It comes and finds you. And such is the case with every besetting sin. And it's unique to every individual Christian. You see, the world system was designed masterfully to saturate each person to discover his or her most vulnerable point. This has become obvious even with today's technology and its ability to record your digital movements. Your, they call it a digital footprint. Your, your uh, searches, your purchases, your likes, your desires, even your conversations. Who among us has not had a conversation about a random subject only to find that advertisement pop up the next day on our computer screen or our phone? I gave the example a a few weeks ago. My youngest son was at the the, uh, ball field and he's allergic to grass. He began to have a, a rash. So I, I took him, the coach told me, I ran to Walmart, and uh, the, the pharmacist, I said, he's, he's having an allergic reaction, what do I need to get into him? And she told me something that was akin to Benadryl, but it had a different name, Dysex or Dysonex or something, never heard of it. 
So I buy it, give it to him, he goes out, he plays again, and then when I look on my phone, the next thing that pops up is an advertisement for that medicine. I had never heard of it. I had never spoken it. And so Big Brother is indeed watching us, but it's a bigger brother than big government. It's a satanic Big Brother. It's a, it's a world system that is designed to collect data, always collecting intel, intel, and the purpose of it is to locate and to exploit your weakest point individually. That's the brilliance of Satan's system. Don't, don't, don't think that he's not highly intelligent. He is far more intelligent than you and I. And to be a Christian in Satan's realm is to live under constant surveillance and specific targeted attack. He knows how and where to attack. And so we are attacked indirectly through the world system. And then fifthly, we're attacked indirectly through wicked human actors. Paul mentioned cosmic powers last week in Verse 12, and our exegesis there revealed that he's speaking of wicked world rulers who, prompt, who are prompted, presided over, and influenced by demonic forces. The purpose of that is to perpetuate this world system that we spoke of, and they do it either by making wicked executive decrees or law, or by implementing policies that accomplish the same, just more covertly and over time so that we don't realize we're being controlled uh, uh, societally by him. We here at this church prefer to separate Christianity and politics as much as possible for that very reason. But Satan weaponizes politics and policies, according to Paul, to keep the world in subjection to him and specifically to apply intense pressure to Christ's congregations generally and to individual Christians particularly. And so this is the stress that you feel. This is the pressure that you feel. This is why when people die, what do we say? Rest in peace because all of the pressures of a sinful world have been released. But this is Satan's realm. And this is why we've been told that God translated us out of darkness and into light, the glorious kingdom of Christ's congregations. So all of these pressures seem insurmountable for us, yet God has granted us certain spiritual protections and weapons for the battle at hand. And I'd like to talk about those this morning. There's six in particular. From verses 12 through 14a, a form of the word stand occurs four times in close succession. In Greek, the last word in verse 13 and the first word in verse 14 are both stand. He, he says it twice back to back. And so the obvious emphasis is to stand. All four occurrences in Greek mean to stand at a fixed point in time. In other words, you weren't standing, you were walking, you were laying down, whatever. But he says to stand and the voice has the sense that you keep on standing. In fact, that you never stop standing. So it's stand and keep on standing. That's what the grammar tells us. That's God breathed. That's what the syntax tells us. But here's the question that every Christian must answer based on God's breathed word. You have the weaponry to stand. Do you have the inner courage to stand against all forces of evil as they bear down upon you? That's what the syntax reveals. That's the question that must be answered today, now, this moment, before you leave this room. Do you have the internal courage and conviction to stand when a hurricane of evil is flying all around you? That's what Paul calls us to. We get caught up in the armor and all of that, but the real issue is what's underneath that armor inner 
Holy Spirit wrought conviction to stand against evil. We need it. And the apostle gives us six areas in which we stand. There may be more, but these are the ones he chose to reveal. First, stand in the truth. Verses 13 and 14a. You can read there, it says, uh, stand in the truth, the belt of truth, verse 14. And he refers to this evil day. That's talking about the time then in the first century and now in the 21st century when Satan is active. It's interesting, John MacArthur notes that Paul probably at the time that he wrote these words was actually chained to a Roman soldier. If that is true, and he looked at that soldier's belt, it reminded him metaphorically of, of a, a, a belt of truth that the Christian must have for this invisible war. The belt of truth. The belt in those days was larger than a, uh, a belt on, on your blue jeans today. It was, it was a larger belt. It, it girded up the man. It gave him uh, support from a uh, poor posture. It braced him uh, from the, the midsection, the core. And so we have to ask this question on a spiritual level. If we are to put on the belt of truth, what exactly is truth? What is truth? truth. Truth is the unpolluted facts about something without any mixture of any error. Do you agree with that? Truth is the unpolluted facts about something without any mixture of any error. We can go no further unless we all agree on that. Otherwise, we've got a different definition of truth. The unpolluted facts about something, anything, without any mixture of any error. Scripture presents all truth as fixed, never changes. Scripture presents all truth as absolute. And Scripture presents all truth as emanating from the innermost being of God. Now, the opposite is lies. And Jesus said that Satan was the father of lies. In fact, in John 8, 44, he said that Satan, quote, has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Okay, so that's the world system. That's who constructed our world system. But God, on the other hand, is truth. And when God speaks, He speaks out of His own inner character. And what He speaks is always truth. God has never lied. God will never lie. Everything that God says is unadulterated, perfect, pure, absolute truth. Now, Satan's schemes, and you'll find that word in, in these verses, the schemes of the devil, they seek to pollute all truth with a mixture of lies. And he's very subtle about it. He can add a little here or take a little away over there to contaminate pure truth. If he can corrupt truth slightly, then he can redefine it as he sees fit. Or what's even more alluring to depraved, control-driven creatures like you and I is that the devil seeds over to us the authority to redefine truth as we see fit. And that scheme allows for limitless versions of truth. And that's what we're dealing with in our society today. Everyone has their own version of truth. Every man does that which is right in their own eyes. This is all by design. Satan's design is to lead to a total chaos where every person is his own law, his own policeman, and his own judge. That's where we are in our society today. This is why the belt of truth is so vital. We've entered into an era in our day and age called postmodernism. 
The fight for absolute truth has been raging for several generations. We've come out of what's called the modernist era, where we look at everything with a critical, skeptical, analytical eye, and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that after decades of this level of scrutiny, man has become so skeptical and so analytical that he's convinced himself truth is no longer attainable, and therefore truth only resides in the eye of the beholder. In other words, I am the determiner of truth and no one else. This is full-blown postmodernism. this idea that truth is relative. Each person has his own version of truth. Today it's expressed, you'll see it on social media, my truth is X, Y, or Z. That's not my truth. What is your truth? All of these are, are comments that, that come forth from a position of postmodernism. And it's even worked its way into the church. When you hear things in your Bible study, maybe you've said this, I don't mean to make light of it. I've, I have said it before and had to correct myself. You're teaching a lesson, you read a verse, and you say, what does this mean to you? That's a problem. You have just seeded over truth to multiple individuals to determine truth for themselves. And you get 12 different answers. Well, it means this to me based upon my personal experience. It means this to me. Well, what you're really asking is, how does this truth apply to you? Now, that's better. But the truth is found only in the original author's intent and nowhere else. That's who God chose to reveal as a medium the truth, in this case, the Apostle Paul. If we can figure out what the Apostle Paul is saying, what is truth as, is, as it is written, then we know what truth is as God determined it. And that will cut the legs out from under postmodernism. But that's the first thing. You know, the Bible speaks of this in the Old Testament when it says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It was the Old Testament postmodernism, and now it's repackaged itself in modern times. Truth, 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 truth cuts through deception. Truth exposes ulterior motives. Truth casts light on Satan's dark schemes. It exposes his true character. And this is why Paul begins with the, the, the command, the imperative, we must stand in truth. That is the gateway to all other era, uh, errors. And so truth must be firm, must be fixed, and we must wrap it around our waist tightly like a belt. Second, we must stand in Christ's righteousness, verse 14b. It speaks of a breastplate. The breastplate was made of leather or metal, and it covered the vital organs, specifically the heart. So that's why it's called a breastplate. In Jewish thought, the heart controlled the intellect, the will, the emotions, the innermost part of a person's being. Now, some people like John Calvin, for instance, imagine that this breastplate of uh, righteousness refers to righteous living. And I see his point, but I don't think he's right. It seems more consistent with the text and the context in which Paul is writing, spiritual warfare, to see this as Christ's imputed righteousness, the breastplate of Christ's imputed righteousness, meaning this, no matter what demonic forces throw at you, no matter how they tempt you, no matter what charges they level at you, no matter how much they play with your mind, they cannot penetrate Christ's breastplate of perfect righteousness, which cloaks you by faith. That's a marvelous gift of grace. Perhaps you struggle yourself with doubt. Perhaps you struggle with fear of maybe God is not pleased with you, that you haven't done enough, that you're not good enough, that you're not smart enough. Maybe you struggle with these in the, the depths of your own mind. Christ's righteousness protects you during those times. In the Pilgrim's Progress, you might remember Apollyon, who is Satan, 
confronts the main character, Christian, with a litany of his sins and failures. And that's how Satan attacks. You've done this and this and this, and how could you be a Christian if you've done all of those things? You go to church, you worship, and yet you go home and you do evil things. Evil, evil, evil. You can't be a Christian. How can you be a Christian? Who says you're a Christian? Christian bravely replies, All this is true, and much more, which thou hast left out. But he stood cloaked in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Brother, sister, you stand absolved of all sin in Christ's righteousness. That's your breastplate. Not your own works, not your own merits, not your own checklists. Those are worthless dung. It's Christ and His righteousness. Satan cannot penetrate that breastplate which is applied to you. It has already been declared. You stand not pardoned, not acquitted, but rather perfectly righteous before the supreme judge of the earth, God Almighty. You stand in Christ's righteousness. God looks at you as if you lived the perfect life of Jesus Christ. That, brothers and sisters, is your breastplate. That is what you call to bear when Satan tempts you and distracts you. Stand in his righteousness. Stand in truth. And thirdly, stand in a settled conscience. Verse 15. He speaks here of of shoes or boots or footwear of some sort. Uh, John MacArthur states, quote, The Roman soldier's shoes or boots were usually impregnated with bits of metal or nails to give him greater traction as he climbed a slippery cliff and greater stability as he fought. End quote. So you, you, you've got some tread underneath your shoes. You've got some traction, some footing, some solid footing. And what Paul is saying is that the child of God who stands in God's truth and is cloaked in Christ's righteousness is prepared to walk the earth with sure footing and a calm, peaceful demeanor, even as the battle rages around him. This is what he's saying. It's a beautiful promise. He goes on, we have been reconciled by the gospel of peace. This is what Paul says, the gospel of peace. We stand in a peaceful disposition with God, in a righteous standing, a peaceful. He's no longer wrathful toward us or angry. We stand in a peaceful disposition, ready to proclaim ready to explain, ready to defend His work in our hearts wherever we go. If we are personally attacked, it is the gospel of peace which rescues us as it floods our battle-wearied soul. And you know you've been there. You fought. You fought spiritual uh, battles. You fought demons. And you know you've come to the end of yourself. And then what happens? The gospel of peace flows into your heart and restores you to life where you thought you were dead. This is the gospel of peace. And we need to stand in it. Truth, Christ's righteousness, the gospel of peace. Fourth, we need to stand in unshakable conviction. You look at verse 16, it speaks of the shield. Soldiers had two types of shields. They had a small arm shield, or they could have a large shield that actually covered the whole body. And he's speaking here of the large shield that covers the whole body. He calls it the shield of faith. Uh, in, in Paul's days, they put these men with these shields on the front lines of battle because they could, they, could, uh, th- th- they could form a barrier and they could duck down below the shield and be totally protected. And that's the image here. When the devil is firing darts at us, you have a shield on the front lines of battle that will create a barrier to protect you. It's a shield of faith, Paul says. Faith. What faith? Faith in what? There's all kinds of 
that's a, a generic term these days. Faith is thrown around. I, I was listening to a sports talk radio, and the, the host said, I really respect the, the BYU football coach because he's a man of faith. He's not a man of my faith. My faith is Jesus Christ alone and not my own merits. He stands in a faith of Jesus Christ plus his own merits. That's, that's a different faith. So faith in what? We need to define faith. Faith is extremely important when society, even the religious world, has hijacked that term and broadened it to where it means nothing at all. If our shield is faith, faith in what? If we stay just within Paul's context here, because he's the author, we have a faith that God chose unto himself an elect children before the foundation of the world. Paul began with that in Ephesians 1 verse 3. We have faith that Christ redeemed those elect children by his blood sacrifice. Paul says that next in Ephesians 1 verses 7 through 12. We have faith that the Holy Spirit of God sealed his elect children and we find that in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And we have faith that those elect children, you and I, will reign victoriously with King Jesus over all enemies in heaven, on the earth, or underneath the earth. And we find that in Ephesians 1, 20 to 23. That's the faith that we hold. That, and you see, within the context of the spiritual invisible war, we read those verses way back uh, several months ago, and they made enough sense to us. God chose us. God redeemed us. God gave us the Holy Spirit. God will put us over all of our enemies. That made good sense to us, but it makes even more sense in the context of the invisible warfare. Yes, He chose us. Yes, He redeemed us. Yes, He sealed us with the Spirit. Why? So the devil and, and Satan could not ever take us, could not pluck us out of His hand. And yes, He will place us over Him to rule for ages and ages and eternity to come. And when you see it in the lens of that spiritual warfare, it makes perfect sense. And that's the faith that we have. That's the faith that we believe and we stand in unshakable conviction of that faith. And this faith is composed of at least two elements. You must believe intellectually with your mind that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. That includes the fact that you're a sinner. He died for your sins. He was buried, and He rose again victoriously the third day. But it's also composed of a heart belief. I'm one of the people on this earth who had the intellectual belief for years before I ever had the heart conviction. And the heart conviction includes regeneration, which carries with it repentance of sin, a turning from sin, and a faith from the heart in Jesus Christ, a pledge of allegiance to Him and none other. It's a belief in the facts of the gospel, but it's a belief in the heart, and we must stand in that unshakable conviction. That is our shield, and when the devil fires his fiery darts at us, that shield is the shield that protects us. That shield rises up and repels those fiery darts, and one thing that we never realize is that shield protects us from so many darts we have never even knew were fired. You ever thought about that? There are so many darts that we never even have to engage with because the shield of faith has repelled them. And the only ones that come through are the ones that are ordained of God. And those are ordained of God, even though they may be painful for our sanctification to mold us and conform us more and more into the image of Christ. And so the only things that you struggle with are things that God himself allowed into your life, his permissive will, unshakable conviction. Fifth, we must stand in full assurance. Verse 17a speaks of the hope of salvation, and it's talking about uh, the helmet. 
The helmet is our uh, hope of salvation. John MacArthur again notes that Satan often attacks our head with two main weapons. It's discouragement and doubt. And if you think about it, those, those twin towers, uh, th- there's not much else that, that he can attack us with except discouragement and doubt. Satan's single aim is to train us to think that our salvation is dependent upon our own performance. And even the best Christian, in fact, most of the best Christians, even they struggle with this. Going back into Judaism, going back into a performance-based religion. It's not performance-based. Satan slyly corrupts our thinking along those lines, and he, does it all at, he doesn't do it all at once. He does it bit by bit, and we must strap on the helmet of salvation. Well, what, what is salvation? Salvation simply reminds us that it is all of God and none of ourselves. You don't save yourself. You are saved by God. It's all of God. Jonah the prophet cried from the belly of the well, salvation is of the Lord. He could not save himself. Salvation had to come from another source. And what is this salvation? Well, you all know it. You see it everywhere in our church. It's the order of salvation. God elected us. God called us out of this world and into his glorious light. God regenerated, he birthed our hearts again. God converted us, he gave us faith to believe, and he granted us repentance so that we could turn from sin. He empowered us to do that. He he justified us, he declared us righteous before the heavenly throne. He adopted us as his children on this earth. He he sanctifies us daily through means of grace and also, also through means of sorrow, frankly. He uses everything to sanctify us, and he perseveres us until that time in which he glorifies us with our new body. That's the process of salvation. There was a moment in time you passed from death unto life. That happened at regeneration, but the process will not be completed until we inherit our glorified body. That is the helmet of salvation. One thing that I was, I was so happy about when we designed our new church facility, when you walk in the front door, any door, you walk in the front door, and above the wall, there's a banner that stretches probably, probably 90 feet. And that banner says, election, calling, regeneration, Conversion, justification, sanctification, perseverance, glorification. Why is that banner there? That banner is there to remind every child of God that when they enter into His congregation, we are putting on the helmet of salvation. No matter what spiritual forces throw at us, our head is protected. We cannot suffer a mortal wound. We cannot be destroyed. We can be knocked down. We can be persecuted, but we rise again because that helmet of salvation, once we enter into that process, it's game over. We win. We win. And we want to be reminded of that because as we fight this battle, it's easy to forget. And we need these reminders. We need to stand in our salvation and in full assurance. Lastly, we need to stand fully armed. Verse 17 He speaks here of the sword of the Spirit, and it's interesting, it's a a defensive weapon, not an attacking weapon. We're told to stand, not to charge, and I think there's a spiritual point in there. Paul names the sword of the Spirit as the Word of God. The term that he uses for word is not the normal term logos, which is a broad term for Scripture, but rather it's a, a less used and more precise term, rhema, which means individual words 
or specific teachings. This is what he's saying. You have the sword of the Spirit, the individual words, and the doctrine of God. That's what it, th this verse is saying. For instance, when Jesus was tempted of Satan, Jesus defended himself with specific teachings, specific verses from Scripture. And we would do well to take that example. We defend ourselves when we are under spiritual attack with specific Scripture truths. It's one of the reasons I love, love, love what's going on across the parking lot in our children's department. I went to an awards ceremony last week in between our services where awards were handed out to children who had memorized large sections of Holy Scripture. Why are we doing that? Oh, we want to treasure it up in our heart, yes. Oh, we love the Word of God, yes. But we are equipping those little children with the Word of God, the rhema of God in their hearts, so that when they are attacked spiritually as they enter the invisible war, they have a weapon, a weapon to wield and to defend themselves. And when the Satan attacks them, they are ready. They, some of them memorize John chapter 1, verses 1 through 20, which speaks of the logos of God. And it speaks of Jesus as God, and it's wonderful truths which we can defend ourselves when we're attacked. Learn Holy Scripture. If the children can do it, certainly adults can do it, can't you? Well, I can't remember my own phone number. Then set it to a tune and sing it, because I hear you singing all the time. But memorize it. Learn it. Be ready to use it when the evil one attacks. And so we've come to the end of the armor. Let me make one point and I'll be done. Satan is very crafty. He's very sly. And if he can occupy your attention with fighting things done unto you by external situations, someone falsely accuses you, someone treats you wrongly, someone sabotages your good name, Terrible things. But if he can occupy you with those, then he, he can keep you from fighting the real battles closer to home. Fulfilling your role as a husband, men. Fulfilling your role as a submissive wife, ladies. Being obedient children, young ones. Being a faithful worker, or if you happen to be in a position of authority, being a compassionate, generous master. Those are where the real battles lie. And what's worse is all of those battles over your good name and your reputation and your fighting what's right, you might win those battles, but he's wearing you down. You see, we need to learn that every battle is not a hill to die on. We need to prioritize our battles. We don't want to wear ourselves out fighting battles that really aren't going to, to move the needle. We want to fight the main battles. And he's wearing you down when everything is about you and everything is about your own uh, passions and own desires and own good name. He's wearing you down and wearing you down and wearing you down and wearing you down. And then one day you wake up and you wonder how your children got so far away from you and from God. And you wonder why your marriage has unraveled. And you wonder why your family is falling apart. It's because you weren't there. Oh, physically you were there, but not spiritually. Spiritually, you were fighting other battles in other places to protect your namesake and to protect your reputation, and they're really battles that no one even remembers anymore, while the real battle was raging within your own home, in your marriage, in your relationship with your children, and in your work ethic and your attitude in the workplace.
See, context matters. Those are the areas that Paul listed before he talked about the spiritual warfare. Why? Because once we win the battle in the marriage, and once we win the battle in the family, and once we win the battle in the servant leader environments, it will have a spillover effect into other areas as well. Focus on those battles first. If there's time, we'll fight the other ones. But focus on those first. And never forget to stand. To keep on standing. Never stop standing. You have the equipment. You have the weaponry. The question is, do you have the inner conviction to plant your feet in the day of evil and stand? Stand. Let's pray.